Okay, so we're gonna start this video. Get all situated. Okay. Hello, um, my name is Alice Garner and I am a Chinese adoptee and I am going to tell you my story today. As I said, my name is Alice and I grew up in a small town in Vermont and I was adopted when I was nine months old and my parents are white, um, older um, Caucasian people. I was born, we think, in southern China in Maoming. So if my birth parents are watching this, hello. <laughs> but who knows because the chances of me finding them are very slim. So anyways, when my parents came and they flew from Vermont all the way to China. However, at the time uh, when I was born, they were very strict and they would not allow my parents to come to the orphanage because they, I think for privacy reasons, um, so I'll include some pictures, but I was adopted when I was nine months old and my parents came to a location outside of the city, so in Guangzhou, uh, and they met me and actually when they met me i had a double ear infection and scabies so i was not a happy baby i was very in pain i would say um so that was that was that i definitely was dealing with a lot so it was like a lot of new things all at once my parents took me all the way back to vermont on the like 16 hour plane ride they had this new baby that they had never really you know they had never had a baby before so i'm an only child to add to that i'm an only child um i do not speak we'll put it right out there i do not speak uh any mandarin um i yes yeah, so i am i've been socialized white the my entire life i was a product of the one child policy because i was born in 2002 so that was around the time when they had that one child policy in China where they really did not allow any parents to have more than one child and usually because of the patriarchal system that they were living in slash still are living in that they did not want a girl in their family if they had a girl first they probably would give, her, give them up and if they had a girl second that they definitely would not try to keep them especially since they were not a guy a boy able to work in the fields so yes i was a product as you might say of the one child policy um so yeah so i think that i mainly wanted to make this video because um i think that my identity is very interesting and i want to share my adoption story and my my history of living in vermont and going to uh davidson college which is in north carolina uh, and just share my experiences from both living in Vermont, living in Davidson, um, growing up as a transracial, transnational ad adoptee. I think that has been very interesting and this interesting intersectionality between both my genders. I'm a woman, obviously, and I'm Asian, so I'm an Asian woman, so that definitely makes things complex as well as I've been socialized white, so all I've ever really known before going to college is just a white life in Vermont. and. Uh, I also, my parents are middle class to upper middle class, so I think that has also created an interesting dynamic in the opportunities that I've been able to have. For example, that I have, I would not be able to go to Davidson if it were not for my parents and their support and their ability to provide to me. Um, so I'm eternally grateful to them. Um, so. I think that my intersectionality is very much, um, I think, ensues, th therefore ensues an identity crisis, but I think that all adoptees have, but I think that um, I really would like to share my story and my story as a only child adoptee living in Vermont. As I said before, I lived in a predominantly white town called Norwich, Vermont, 
and Norwich is a very um, wealthy place and I'll just preface this with saying that I feel very grateful to have lived in Norwich for my 18 years of my life. Fate had it that we actually, my parents already had land in Norwich before all the taxes rose and it became very expensive to live there so hence the reason why we were able to live in Norwich and continue to be living in Norwich. Um, anyways, uh, so Norwich is a very rich town. It's one of the richest towns in Vermont. In addition, it's surrounded by Dartmouth area and the hospital. So as you can see, the school system, um, the sc I was very lucky to have a great school system. However, it did mean that all of my classmates were mainly white. I mean, my school system I actually just recently found out was 87% white. And that was, I think, just recently so I'm pretty sure it's gotten more diverse so it probably is like 90 to 95 percent white I'm not exactly sure the stats though but anyway so as I grew up in you know uh elementary school going to Marion Cross School, Richmond Middle School, Hanover High School it was a very predominantly white space almost all my teachers were white almost all of my classmates were also white and almost all of them were very privileged they had either doctors lawyers professors at the college uh for parents and they were very just very wealthy and as i said before like i feel very grateful to have been in a middle class um to upper middle class family however like i would i would like to say preface that i mean all my friends most of my friends were pretty much upper class um so Yes, that was just part just to set the scene. That was definitely all I knew before really going off to college. I um, I did swimming, I ran, I did predominantly, you know, white dominated sports as well as just in a w predominantly white area. And so I think this definitely played into effect the way that I saw my own identity growing up, um, just living in an area where all my friends were white, all the people I really looked up to, my, uh, my teachers and everyone that I really like saw, including my parents who I, um, you know, as a kid, you put them on a pedestal, all of them were white. So I think that this is a very interesting um, kind of way to be socialized. Some people asked me if I speak Chinese, um, which by the fact, by the way, is a form of microaggression. Um, just because I like Chinese does not mean I speak Chinese um, or Mandarin. So when I came back to Vermont from China, so when I was nine months old, um, I was very little obviously and I was very overweight as you can see by these photos. Um, the, I did not get a lot of exercise in the orphanage at all. I actually have physical scars on both sides of my legs that are pretty noticeable um, that they think I got from the orphanage and just from rubbing against the crib they think that that's how i got these scars and i also scar very easily so i think it's very interesting that i have like physical scars actually from um from being in the orphanage but anyways um so let's see i so when i was very little my parents took me to mandarin classes at dartmouth i think when i was very little but i was only two or three so i really don't remember that and we did not have chinese offered in the school system so i never really found interest in taking Chinese lessons um, on the side. Um, when I was very little, we also participated in FCC, Families with Children from China. And so that was a program where I got to meet other adopted children. Uh, in addition, we also participated in Dao Pals, which is Dartmouth Asian Organization Pals, where they would pair Chinese kids or Asian kids with other Asian um, mentors or just older people college students um and so that was when i was like probably from about like four till about like eight or maybe a little bit younger to a little bit older but anyways like both of the programs i really was grateful for but at the same time i feel like it was a definitely an a place where it was kind of just like i mean i was very young so i, I didn't really know anything else and it kind of just seemed like um Playdates. I mean, it felt like I was, you know, getting to know other Asian kids, but at the same time, we didn't even, we didn't really go to school together. It was kind of like an event, so it didn't really feel like part of my normal life, if I should say that. Um, and so, and also, I didn't really get the kind of importance of having, you know, a strong Asian community at the time. And that also kind of faded out when I was, when it started to go into middle school. I think it ended around elementary school. And so, middle, middle school to high school, I didn't really have that kind of socialization. My family and I did celebrate um, Chinese New Year every year with that FCC organization and we kind of, 
you know, had this American Chinese food and we gathered around and made some Chinese crafts. But really, you know, the China that I knew when I was younger was never really, I would say, the China that was like in reality at the time. And now I feel like I would always had an image of China in my head that was kind of a glorified version, I would say. And so I think that's a very interesting part of my story and kind of definitely adds to layers of complexity within my identity as well. In 2015, I went back to China and it was actually for my 13th birthday. And um, just going along with like, you know, how China was portrayed in my eyes, I went back to China. I went on this heritage trip with 10 other families, many other adoptee families, and all of them were adopted. Uh, and it was great to, you know, kind of form a, a community of adoptees. And I think I, I was very aware of that even when I was 13. Uh, and however, it did feel like kind of an Americanized experience, even when I was in China. Even though I felt like I blended in with everyone else, I still felt like an outsider because I socialized white. I definitely felt kind of aware of my race in that moment because I was like, oh, I'm Chinese, but I'm not Chinese enough because I'm socialized white. And I think that was definitely something that I also was just kind of aware of in general about being Asian is that there's also this kind of constant pull and, and reason why I'm having this identity crisis is, oh, well, I'm, I'm white, socialized white, but I'm not white enough because I'm Asian, but I'm Asian, but I'm not Asian enough because I was socialized white. So there's this kind of, kind of like balance, imbalance within my life that I'm constantly trying to associate myself with and not associate my, with myself, trying to fit in but not fit in. So I think that's been definitely a different and added layer into my identity that I've been grappling with. And so I went back to China and I felt like it was very interesting. I actually, I was served all Americanized Chinese food. They wouldn't give us Chinese food that was real, which I think was very interesting and honestly not okay with them. I think they should have. Um, and I learned some Chinese there, but I didn't retain anything of it. I went back to, we went to Beijing, Xi'an, Guilin, Shanghai. We also went all the tourist spots. And then we also went to my orphanage. My, um, I met my orphanage director, I met my nanny. I played with some kids in the orphanage that was still there 13 years later. And I thought that was, for my parents, it was a very emotional experience, but I felt like for me, I didn't really understand the impact of it. I thought it was cool and everything, but thinking back, I definitely like, I think I would definitely want to go back to China and kind of, you know, go back, but I don't know how, what it would trigger, like what emotions it would trigger for me. Um, because I think when I was younger, I didn't really understand the form. I was still formulating my identity. I'm still formulating my identity now, but I think it's a lot more formed than it was like six years ago. So I think that's been very interesting. And, and I think it was still very impactful, but I also think that it probably will change as I get older and kind of I think a question that I also like face as an adoptee is like, do you want to find your birth parents? And I think my answer would be no. I think that I'm very happy. I feel very privileged to say that I'm happy with the way that my life is now. And I think that like, I feel very lucky to be going to Davidson, to be in Vermont with my parents, even though there are definitely different troubles being in a predominantly white area. I do feel lucky to be where I am now. I think I obviously don't see, I don't see myself living in Vermont permanently, but um, because of the lack, the lack of diversity. But I do think that in general, I don't want to seek out an alternate story because sometimes I do think about like what it would be like to kind of like have the alternate storyline of me being in Maoming, China, in the rice fields or doing something, but that's not my story and fate has let it for me to be here. And I think that like, if I did end up finding my birth parents, there would be definitely a lack of connection because of cultural differences and it would just be a lot different. And I did feel like that when I when I met my nanny and met my orphanage director, I, we had to have a translator. It was very divided and, and I felt like, I don't think I would have a connection with my birth parents because I was socialized white. I lived in America. It's interesting, you know, going to college and, and then looking back at my own identity. I think that like looking back at my high school and middle school years, I think I had a lot of, you know, pent up emotions inside, to be honest, that were nothing like, I mean, I never should feel guilty for having them. All my emotions are valid for in that moment. And the reason why I'm feeling that is totally valid. And I recognize that. I think it's just very interesting to kind of be retrospective and, and look back at, you know, the 
the derivation of my emotion and, and the reasons why I acted this way or didn't want to do this or didn't want to do that. And so I think that definitely played out in and was manifested in certain events such as uh, when I was little, when I was in second grade, I started playing piano and I loved playing piano. I uh, my parents, you know, they were very real with me. They said, you know, look, Alice, if you're not going to practice, you're not going to have piano lessons. And so um, I I think that, you know, part of my core personality, I think that it definitely still would have played out. But I think that I wanted to have a balanced life, you know, as I grew older and as I grew, went into high school. And I didn't really want to have my life be dominated by one thing, such as piano. So I think that as I grew older, piano kind of definitely took a back seat. Um, however, I also think that um, the reason why that also did and it was definitely the first thing to take the back seat was because I am Asian and I didn't really want to, when I was playing piano, I didn't really want people to associate me with, you know, piano and, you know, that, that Asian girl playing piano and I was really trying to shy away from these stereotypes, uh, the societal stereotypes that I felt like other people were holding um, to me. I remember when I was in middle school and I played for this, you know, elder person event at our nursing home and then after that um, there was another Asian kid who played after me and then they asked me if I was dating them and I was like, I didn't really understand at the time that, that was definitely my progression and really not okay to ask but I was like, no, no, we're not dating, um, why, would you, why would you think that? Um, so I think that that kind of definitely, like those kind of comments definitely kind of, I think, hit deeper than I thought in that I definitely didn't want to be playing at any high school recitals or anything outside of my piano organization. I definitely wanted to like keep it on the DL, that keep it on the download that I was playing piano just because I felt you know self-conscious about it and I think looking back obviously I'm kind of sad because now like I don't play piano as much just because I don't have time at Davidson but it's definitely something I want to get back into and now that I've kind of come to terms with my own identity and kind of become more comfortable it's something that I do want to try out more so piano is definitely one thing that I feel like in my life that I really enjoyed it was a big part of my life but at the same time I think that there are definitely some stereotypes that I was afraid of being associated with and something that I couldn't really voice to anyone I didn't really have a lot of Asian friends I didn't really have and when I did have Asian friends they had an Asian culture embedded within their childhood whereas I had been cultured and socialized white so I feel like I only had a couple of adoptee friends as well. So I definitely feel like it was hard for me to kind of voice these emotions and kind of, you know, have my feelings validated because um, another thing that I wanted to mention is that um, when I was little and just, you know, I feel like all throughout my 18 years, I, my parents and I didn't really talk about race. We didn't really talk about um, class or just like what it means to be an Asian woman. And so I think that like that kind of, um, lack of discussion um and not that it's my parents fault at all um but i do think that kind of lack of discussion uh was very you know manifested throughout my actions because i was unable to figure out why i was feeling these ways and and i couldn't really understand what these emotions were and so i think that if i had a place and a, and a time and someone to talk to about it at a younger age I feel like I could have really pinpointed those emotions and been like yes this is why i'm feeling this way and like kind of connect the dots um, I think that a reason why that I, a reason why that I feel like my parents never really talked to me, um, about race was because, as I didn't mention, my parents are white, there's definitely a, a gap between, um, both our races, and I think also between our generations, um, my parents are older, and so I think that that also definitely plays into effect of, you know, the kind of conversation topics we can have, and, and the kind of how we can relate to one another, we've grown up in completely different worlds i would say um and so yes yeah, so i think that definitely has something to do with it as i mentioned before i am an only child so i think it does create an interesting dynamic between me being the only asian woman in the household as well as the only asian person you know just in general like um segregation um not in a bad kind of way but i think that just you know being the only child having a child parent dynamic as like power dynamic i think that's been interesting um, and how that plays out. So another way that I feel like 
in high school especially, I would say that I was very wary of this kind of stereotype of being Asian and being good at math. And so I think it's all something that I feel like all Asians have to do with, but I think that it was very interesting for me because I didn't really have parents who kind of were the stereotypical Asian parents. My parents were very kind and they definitely, um, they definitely inspired me to work hard, but I feel like I had a lot of self-motivation, self-determination to work hard in school, that it definitely wasn't something where I felt like I was being pushed to the max because of my parents. And so I think that like, um, came down to math. I actually, in first grade, I came home um, and I told my mom, like, I hate math. And my mom, who was a math major, definitely um, did not like to hear that. And so she was like, Alice, like, we're gonna enroll you in this advanced math program. I don't need to hate math at all. So I did that math program for about eight, years I would say a long time it took it was another big part of my childhood it was called Kumon and so Kumon uh, I feel like definitely you know shaped the way I do math I actually think it was right up to middle school when I took the the math um, placement test in middle school and so I placed into the highest math I was on that advanced math track that set me in seventh grade all the way until high school until senior year so I was on that advanced math track and I feel, feel like that definitely had a lot of effect um, on me as an Asian woman and as as I said before my high school was 90% white at the time so it was like I'm just naturally one of the only Asian people in the class anyways so I feel like there was kind of a lot of pressure put on me as an Asian uh as a Chinese person to be good at math however like I mean algebra my, my first year and then pre-calc okay but then calm calculus and uh, the final class, which is math modeling, you know, I was pretty lost. I was, I was not very good at math. I just, I was getting actually C pluses on the test. I got a C plus my first semester of calculus, and then I got a B plus my second semester. Uh, I just was not good at it. I failed a lot of tests, and um, it was interesting to me because a lot of my friends came up to me and I'd be like, and I think also part of the Hanover High School culture is oh like compare grades what are you what are you good at what are you not good at which test did you fail like competing on how many like copious number of hours and an inordinate amount of hours you would spend on homework that was just not a healthy culture but in addition you know i would say oh ha ha i failed a test and i failed a math test and they'd be like oh alice no you didn't you did not you could not you could never fail a test and i was like no like i did and they were like no it's not possible and i was like yes it is like it is possible and so then I was like no like it is possible like I definitely did fail my math test and they were just in in on mainly these were white people asking me and so I thought that was very interesting in that I was like oh like are they complimenting like my hard working skills or are they complimenting or assuming that because I'm Asian I'm good at math therefore I can never fail you know like I feel like there are a lot of implicit biases in everyone and you can't really I could never really understand or tell it was definitely something I did write my um, high school college essay on because as an adoptee, what else would I write about? Um, so I thought that was very interesting. I just felt pretty much like I was confused. I was like, oh, are they, you know, complimenting me on my hardworking skills or because I'm good at math or because I'm Asian? I never would know. And so I think that definitely, you know, was in the back of my mind, but I couldn't really like verbalize. I couldn't really like express it to my friends. I felt kind of like very trapped and suppressed, but I didn't really know it at the time. And I think also like in high school, I was going at a million miles per hour. I was doing so many things. I didn't really, I didn't really understand, but I also didn't really have time to think about it. For example, all my friends were white, as I was saying, almost all my friends were very rich, very white. Um, I just thought it was the new normal to have like three different houses in different places, to have your car when you were 15, to be able to privilege to do this, to do that. And I was like, oh, like, is this reality? Like, I thought that was reality. I thought that was just the way life worked. And like, I soon realized that that's definitely not, um, but that's kind of the way that I grew up. And I think that's a very interesting concept to me um and i think that you know being in that kind of environment i feel like is definitely now that i think about it definitely emotionally draining but i think it's very interesting because before i got to college and even my first semester you know i had all my white friends i was very comfortable with that i was okay with that i didn't really understand it or notice that like oh yeah i am the minority in that room before you know going around norwich going around hanover high school i had all my classes you know i, I didn't really 
I didn't really understand or realize that, oh, maybe I am the token Asian friend. Maybe I am, like, this is, like, this is the normal. Like, I should be comfortable in predominantly white situations where maybe I actually, like, wasn't 100%, but I didn't really know that. So I thought that was very interesting. Like, all of my life, like, I really just kind of went along, with, like, being comfortable in predominantly white spaces, you know, being comfortable, like, not really talking about race and i think that like i didn't really need to talk about race i mean obviously now it's such a prevalent conversation in my life and something that's always kind of i'm aware of but i think that like being in that kind of situation for 18 years like that's the way i grew up nobody really talked about race so why should i as a like why should i be the one to carry the conversation like i didn't really understand that i didn't really understand the slew also of like stereotypes and i knew like the, you know the basic asian stereotypes of um you know uh wearing glasses, being good at math. I think that I was kind of straying away from those, but I never really like pinpointed like, oh, the reason why I don't want to do this is because I don't want to be associated with these stereotypes. Like I didn't really make a hundred percent that connection. So I think that like, oftentimes it's kind of just like right below the surface. And I was kind of just like carrying on with life, like being okay with it. And I was like, okay, like maybe I have some emotions, but I don't really understand why, or maybe the reason why I think that also, like, I think this is also interesting. Like, you know, in high school, I, and also until now, like, I haven't dated, dated anyone seriously, and I think that, like, oftentimes I'd be in situations where I would uh, be in a place where I was kind of doubting myself for it, and I was kind of like, oh, like, they would never like me, or they would never, you know, think of me this way, and I think part of that was the tie to being, like, but I didn't know this at the time, was, oh, yeah, like, they never really would like me because I don't meet those, you know, traditional European, like, beauty standards or also I am Asian so why would they like me and so I think I mean obviously that's sad to think about now because I feel like I've come a long way with confidence and you know building up my confidence and, and really being confident in my identity and who I am as an Asian woman but I think that that definitely also played a part in my like high school elementary middle school and high school kind of career but I think that you know like living in this school system and, and living in this kind of location where i was always like the only asian person in a situation always the only asian person walking in the street all of that um luckily i feel like i didn't actually not face many microaggressions or outright racist like situations i knew of um at the time so i felt very grateful for that which is also i think why race was constantly not on the forefront of my mind i think that in the classroom it was a little interesting in that um i feel like the dynamic between my teachers was a little bit um i think that like you know as an asian the model minority like myth the stereotypes the the associations with the asians being the model minority is definitely true i think that like for me as like I feel like I'm a very hardworking, dedicated student and, and it was all because of my own drive and not because of anybody else. But I think that also like when I was in the classroom as the only Asian person, not even in those math classes, but also just in general, I feel like I was kind of held to a higher standard because of my race. So I think that's very interesting. I feel like I can never really like explicitly say so because I think that all of this is very implicit and I don't really, can't really physically draw a tie to like, oh, this is why the teachers were acting this way or whatever but i do think that there is suspect to that i also think it kind of created a very interesting environment in that as an asian woman maybe i did feel a little bit suppressed and like speaking out about certain things because you know i'd be that poc woman you know speaking out against a white male teacher or something so i think that was very interesting for me i don't think i ever drew those connections but a lot of this is me retrospectively looking back at my high school and my middle school career and kind of just thinking about oh like maybe this was why i was feeling a little bit you know different i also think that high school is such a draining environment already to be in a to be a poc at, at a pwi predominantly white institution I just can't imagine now looking back like being at Davidson is draining but I feel like being like in high school and not and not really understanding that but also just having to deal with that and like just dealing with so many unearthed emotions and like suppressed emotions must be very difficult so kudos to me <laughs> yeah so I also feel like you know like living in Norwich I as I was saying before like I wasn't very aware and attuned to those kind of situations where like oh that's a microaggression or oh that's a racist like time i feel like there was only a couple you know concrete examples where i can really think about i worked in dan and wits which is the local general store in my town 
and there was one time when I was working in the register in 2017 and this was my sophomore year and I there was this white man kind of a younger man in his 30s who came up to me and I was at the register and they said first first they said oh like speak to me like in Mandarin like like and I was like oh I, I don't speak Mandarin and they said oh like oh like do you speak like Japanese like like any other like Asian language and I was like no like I'm adopted and this was like right in front of everyone and all this slew of customers and I was like a little uncomfortable and didn't really understand and like pinpoint that like oh that was a microaggression that was like a, a racist remark um uh, because it did make people uncomfortable and like obviously my emotions are valid um for feeling uncomfortable because why would anyone else like I mean I feel uncomfortable you know as I said before like I was socialized white all I know is like being cultured white and so I think like I forget like oh yeah like people see me and obviously they can form whatever you know like opinions they want about me and I can't obviously help that but I forget like oh when people see me like do they think of me as like you know like I think I forgot like oh like, they might think of me as like someone who is cultured in an Asian household where in reality I'm not so then the next time they came in they came in a couple days later and they're like oh I'm so happy that there's some diversity finally like in front of Daniel Woods, like, I'm so glad, and I was like, okay, so two situations where I, like, definitely feel, felt outright uncomfortable, however, like, I do feel that even though I have not had, like, many racist experiences in my hometown does not mean that there is so much more work to do in Norwich, in the Upper Valley, in Vermont, in the world, you know, as a whole, but I do feel like there is so much performative activism in Vermont, and especially in Norwich, um, I think that many people pride themselves for being, um, you know, liberal, for hanging their Black Lives Matter signs, for the BIPOC Lives Matter signs, but in reality, like, are you doing your part to, you know, continue on your anti-racist journey, to continue to, you know, foster conversations, difficult dialogues with people of color, with other white people about your own privilege and the white privilege you hold? Do you have, do you read different books, you know, do you educate yourself in, in different medias, do you donate to d different organizations? It's more than just hanging the flag. And it's more than just hanging the American flag and thinking that it's okay. So even though I have not had, you know, direct, you know, several like numerous racist times in my life, um, where I've been called, I've never been called an Asian slur, that does not mean that I still do not face oppression. I obviously am aware of my intersectionality between my race and my gender and my socioeconomic class, but I also would like to point out that, you know, we are living in a society, I'm living in a society right now on August 8th, 2021, in a society that does not favor me because of the color of my skin, because of my gender, because the way that I externally look that I cannot change. I'm living in a society that is constantly oppressing me and discriminating me and making me um, fight for the opportunities. So I think that, you know, that does not, that should not discount my experiences, my lack thereof, of like many racist experiences. Like just because I feel like I have been fortunate to not have many, you know, outright racist experiences where I've been called slurs, but that still doesn't mean that, you know, like as I am living in Vermont or in traveling through New York City, that I do not feel afraid, especially due to the anti-Asian hate, afraid of my life being taken away because of the color of my skin. Now we transition to college. So as you know, or as people know, for people who follow my YouTube, subscribe. Um, for people who don't know, I go to Davidson College, which is in North Carolina, and it is right by the Charlotte area. Um, Davidson's town itself is very white, I should say. Um, when I was looking for colleges, I was looking for a school that was diverse. However, Davidson is not very diverse. It is diverse, more diverse than Hanover and Norwich, but that's not saying anything because as I said before, Hanover and Norwich are 99% white. So anyways, Davidson is a predominantly white institution or there are definitely um, buildings that held slaves. Uh, on still on Davidson's property and I think that we are in the south I think that that whole environment definitely fosters very interesting conversations kind of forces them in our face so I went to college I was super so I went to college a year ago and I think it's crazy to see how much I've changed in a year but anyways 
I went to college in um, Davidson and I was really excited to, you know, get out of New England. Part of the reason why I wanted to go to Davidson was because I wanted I wanted a diverse, more diverse school. I wanted a community that was not just the same New England community that I've been surrounding by, that I have been surrounded by my whole entire life. I wanted something new. I wanted a change. I wanted new perspectives. And I think I got that. I think I definitely got that. As I said before, like, you know, like being in a Southern place, like it really kind of forces you to have more conversations about race. Um, I think it's very interesting though, because kind of similar to Vermont and Norwich, um, specifically i would say that because we are in a liberal area of north carolina i feel like many students at davidson kind of excuse themselves for having excuse themselves from having deep dialogues about race and racism because oh i go to a liberal arts school oh i go to davidson like that can excuse me from having uh having these kind of discussions and i i think there are definitely like dialogues about race and racism uh, in the college, but I think that there should be more. And obviously I think that you can always dialogue about race and racism more. Every person has an equal, like equal stage of the conversation. Everyone can contribute. Whereas um, one person can say how they've been oppressed. The other person can say how they've been their oppressor and how they have, have had privilege. I think that everyone should identify and really evaluate their own privilege in society. Like I can say that I have privilege being, you know, being, of a higher socioeconomic status, status of being able to have parents who can provide for me at this time and place in my life. I feel grateful and very lucky to have that um, and to just recognize that privilege and that lack thereof and to kind of just really dig deep into that. I went to Davidson, I was really excited. I predominantly, my first semester, had many friends who were kind of similar class and race and gender of my high school because I think that's really all I really knew. And I think those people were absolutely lovely and wonderful people, very kind. Everyone in Davidson is pre predominantly like very, very kind. And that was very interesting. I was, uh, many of them were similar to the people I'd surrounded myself with high school in high school just because I didn't really know no other and so automatically I think that's kind of what I gravitated to. I think it's interesting I didn't really have many people of color who I was friends with. I actually was like trying to shy away from being in the Stride organization which is the organization for people of color and I think this is very interesting to kind of unearth this internalized racism that I did hold and I think I'm still trying to unearth that but um yeah, I think it was very interesting because I didn't really want to be in the Pan Asian Student Association, which I actually am an eboard member now, and I'm very proud to be a Pan Asian Student Associ Association member. But I think that's very interesting to kind of retrospectively think about because I, when I went to Davidson, I didn't really want to be involved in organizations that you know were with people of color. I think I was afraid, and I think I definitely developed internalized racism towards both my own race and both like other people of color and I think it's very important to to dig deeply about and kind of unearth those implicit biases that you do hold and that's something that I've been trying to do that's very emotionally draining but definitely worth it so anyways I think that that was very interesting I remember this one uh this one time in my life or this one moment where I was it was October and there was a PASA so Pan Asian Student Association PASA um, so there was a meeting that was in person and it was on this, you know, big lawn and I was walking by with my friend who was white and I was thinking about going but then I saw them all in a circle and I was just like, this is too exclusive, I won't fit in, I'm Asian, like I, I but I'm adopted, I won't fit in. So I kind of just kept my head low and I, and I sprinted past them and I hope they wouldn't notice me. And I think that now thinking back on that, I'm like, wow, I can't believe I did that because now like, I think it's very interesting that I, um, now moving into second semester, I feel like when I came into second semester, I definitely surrounded myself with more people of color, more uh, friends who were of different um, ethnicities. And I feel like I definitely developed deeper friendships within those, um, friends of color because I think that there's something within you know being friends with a person of color that there's a bond of empathy that's really embedded within your friendship because you know 
what it is like to be oppressed and you know that feeling and you know that intersectionality and I think that that kind of unspoken bond is very important and and very important because it provides more emotional bond in addition to less emotional en energy exerted trying to connect to someone because you already are connected by your race or by the ways that you are oppressed because of your different races. So my first semester of college, I really was not, I feel like I wasn't very aware of uh, why, or I wasn't really, didn't really feel like I was oppressed a lot at Davidson. I felt very happy, 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 happy. And I feel like that's really how I was ha throughout my 18 years. I was happy, 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 happy. And I think that's good. I mean, obviously I'm a very happy person. I remember my parents telling me how, um, how happy I was as a baby and just like how jubilant I was and I think I am still very jubilant um but I do think that come second semester there were a lot of real things that I do with had to deal with and I think that um and I obviously recognize that privilege in that statement that I just said that like that layered sense of privilege that you know like I didn't really have to go through a socioeconomic like trauma throughout my life I was very secure within I was able to have all these opportunities I was able to come to Davidson and I was really able to you know I was surrounded by a white community and as I said, as I said before I didn't really have to have deal with a lot of racial trauma overtly I think that like being adopted creates trauma in and of itself I was literally left on a step and I didn't and I don't know my birth parents, but I do think that like in general, my life was very privileged. But anyways, going into the second semester of college, um, I definitely was trying to find my groove, trying to figure out who I really vibed with. But in addition, as I said before, or in addition, there was um, increase in anti-Asian hate, uh, especially in March. Uh, there was the Atlanta shootings that happened the same day as my adoption day. And that was extremely traumatizing. And I would say that I had that to do with. In addition, I was taking this class called Dialogues of Race and Racism, where I was really unearthing my internal racism inside of me in terms of just my racial biases that I held against myself, against others. I was really trying to come to terms with my own identity being adopted. And I was really just having a whole identity crisis. And I was just, there was a lot of emotional energy dedicated into that class two days a week. That was the best class I took ever at Davidson. I highly recommend. Um, I loved the class and I think it was very challenging for me, but it was definitely worth it. Uh, I was having that class. I had obviously the external events that were going on. I was also involved in more anti-racist organizations as I started to come to terms with my identity and figure out like, this is what I want to do on campus. I'm involved in the student initiative of academic diversity for hiring faculty of tenure. First time, I mean, I'm majoring, double majoring in Africana and Hispanic studies. I'm really getting involved with anti-racist organizations and really understanding the power and empowerment that it is to have a woman of color as a professor. Amazing, I've never really had it before. And I was like, wow, this is what it really feels like to be empowered and to feel like you are really represented on that pedestal and really you are, you are seen and heard physically and validated through that person who's standing in front of the room. That is so powerful to me. So really, I think that, you know, being involved in that um, committee that pushes to hire more faculty of color for tenure, who can create that um, diverse and equitable space and included space where everyone feels valued, especially pe people of color. As I said before, I'm also part of the Pan-Asian Student Association. I am also part of STRIDE, so the program that I didn't actually want to be involved in at the beginning of my college career, but now I'm actually a STRIDE mentor, so STRIDE is a student, uh, student program for students of color, and I am part of the Honor Council, and I really want to serve as a representative for diversity and just as a symbol of empowerment for other Asian women and other women of color on the Honor Council. Honor Council is a committee, a student-driven committee that evaluates different cases when, when people violate the Honor Code at Davidson, they go in front of the Honor Council. So I think it's very important to have diversity within the Honor Council and to have representation of as a woman of color. You know, all of that together with that increased anti-Asian hate, the dialogues class that I was having, 
just like coming to terms with my own identity, being involved in anti-racist organizations, continuing to learn how to dialogue about race and racism with other people, with my classmates, with my teachers, with my friends and family. Uh, that was just definitely emotionally draining and I definitely did suffer from microaggressions at Davidson. Uh, several times I had a couple serious ones and that was very emotionally draining um, and it was just a very much learning experience I would say to really learn how to advocate for myself as a woman of color to use my voice to amplify other voices of color. I did take to social media to post about candidly how I felt about anti-Asian hate during the March to my Instagram. And I also, you know, I'm posting this video and I'm posting, you know, I posted my Davidson first year experience video to really try to amplify the voices of color, the women of color, and just to serve as a, as a symbol of empowerment to, you know, other high school students, other Asian women in Vermont, all of the above, other Asian women in North Carolina. So I think that I was dealing with a lot of microaggressions and um, it was definitely emotionally difficult, but I do think that it definitely gave me perspective and it gave me a voice and it forced me to kind of really come out of my shell and really, you know, serve as an advocate. And I want to become a social justice advocate. I want to go into social work. I want to go, um, I want to change the world by really making my mark and putting my foot down and saying enough is enough like we need to fight fight for more equal opportunities we need to fight for a more diverse and equitable space for all of us we need to make our voices heard my second semester at davidson was definitely difficult it definitely was one of the hardest semesters of my life i cried a lot so i definitely was in a lot of pain but i would say that now i'm a lot better as I said before, my mom never really talked to me about what it really means to be a woman of color and what it means to be an Asian woman. So I think that's definitely something that I was battling with second semester when I was trying to really kind of unearth my identity and kind of really evaluate who I am as a person and, and what kind of stereotypes do I face every day and what kind of like oppression that do I face as an Asian woman? Well, part of it is being an Asian woman and, you know, unfortunately having that history of being fetishized, objectified, being subjected to, you know, feeling... Uh, worthless because of my identity and because of the way I am, the way I look. And so I think that that's definitely been a challenge to kind of navigate and figure out. Like, no matter how confident you can be in your own identity, like, other people's perceptions of you, like, you can't change. Like, you can only change the perception of yourself and I can be very confident in myself and like, happy with, with being an Asian woman. But obviously there are going to be situations that come up that you can't control. Um, and so that's been a little bit difficult because at Davidson, I would say that like even though uh, Greek life is not that big at Davidson, e e meaning like the physical number of people who do it, do it, I feel like there is predominantly white focus because it's PWI on the social scene of being, you know, parties with frats and you know predominantly white men surrounding the scene, and so I think that's been very interesting to navigate just because. For me, as an Asian woman, I constantly do fear like you know, those, those stereotypes of being fetishized, objectified, it's something that I obviously have to be cautious of because I don't want to be, you know, subjected to those stereotypes and I have to be cautious and I don't want to be, I, do, I never know what other people are thinking, but I have to look for those red flags and kind of just think about them because I have to be wary of it and I am very wary of it, you know, like I'm, I'm trying to figure out like I've, but who I, you know, I want to spend the rest of my life with, it's kind of like a far out, not really tangible um, ideal right now to me because I'm so young but I feel like it is difficult for me to kind of figure out like oh do I want to be in an interracial relationship because I think that like you know like me figuring out like okay well people of color I you know it's like I definitely love um, my friends of color and I feel like there is this like unspoken bond of empathy but I also think that uh, within an interracial relationship you know obviously I think it can be absolutely gorgeous and beautiful and the the things you can share with one another but I also think that there is a fair amount of emotional energy to be dedicated within that relationship because I think interracial relationships in general are just difficult there has the potential for it to be absolutely beautiful and I think I've experienced that I have some of my best friends are white and I think that like you know bridging that gap between um our identities is something that you can learn so much from somebody else um from you know being vulnerable and sharing your identity and having them listen and actively listen and understand and accept you however it does require i feel like more energy and so that's something i definitely am wary of
Something I wanted to touch on as well was the sort of segregation I have felt at Davidson within the both the POC community and the white community, but as well as the Asian community. You can say like, oh, I'm Asian. Well, yes, I am Asian, but I also am adopted. I am socialized white. And so I think that kind of adds a whole layer into it because I think that like at Davidson, there definitely are like white, there, there definitely are like, there's the Asian Pan-Asian group. However, like many people who are in the Pan-Asian Association, Student Association are cultured um, in Asian households. And I think that that definitely makes it a little bit difficult to relate because like, although we look the same, there's definitely differences in the way we were brought up. I think that's definitely very poignant when we like, and very noticeable sometimes when I'm in conversations. Um, and so I think it's very interesting to sometimes like feel like I'm an outsider within my own racial and group. And so I think that's a very interesting point and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out um, this coming year with no COVID and, and you know, like figuring out um, and meeting other international Chinese students. I think that will be very interesting. Um, but yeah, I think that's been very interesting. I think that I've really associated myself within the adoptee community and I feel like I definitely have found great solace within confiding within the adoptee community. So one of my best friends is an Asian adoptee and so she, I can talk to her about anything and she gets it. She gets what it's like to be discriminated against and how it feels to be kind of an outsider in your own community and, and to kind of just think about it in this perspective and, and I think I very, very much appreciate appreciate her so shout out to you audrey so my second semester as i said was pretty brutal but it also you know i think it really transformed me i transformed so much i was growing a lot and i felt like i was really trying to come to terms with my own identity and i think this summer has also been a huge growing moment for me as well um so i was very nervous at the end of my spring semester so just like april to may area i was very nervous about coming home just because i felt like I had never really talked, as I said before, my parents and I had never really talked about race and I was very nervous about kind of discussing this because it was definitely very difficult for me to kind of come to terms with this and kind of figure out what kind of relationship I wanted with my parents because they are a different race than me, like they understand things differently than I do and there's just very, very big differences between me and my parents but I definitely wanted to come, become closer with my parents and so actually I ended up just like talking to them right when I got off the plane um, about my experiences and I thought that kind of transparency and openness was very important for me to really develop a closer relationship with my parents this summer. I'm very grateful for that. Um, and so I think there's still a long way to go and I think that like for both of us and I think that just learning to understand the kind of relationship that we want for each other and just kind of understanding um, for myself the kind of limits that I want to draw for just relationships in general in terms of like how much emotional energy I want to uh, put into a certain relationship, into any relationship that I have and I think that I was very nervous about coming home but to Vermont, a predominantly white area, but I think I've dealt with it very well. I think that I'm very heavily aware of my race but I think that I am very wary of the kind of emotional energy I want to expend and I think I'm just you know, knowing myself, I think I know myself more. So I know what makes me happy. I know know who makes me happy. I don't feel obligated to spend time with certain people. I feel very free, I feel like a free spirit. And I also just feel like I actually have really, I've gotten into Buddhism. I am now practicing Buddhism and I was really at the end of my semester. One of my dialogues of race and racism, my course that I took over the semester, one of my teachers for that was a religious professor and he was saying how I really should become grounded in religion. So I started journaling at the end of the semester. I started really trying to figure out what kind of religion I wanted. I really wanted to become more in touch with my Asian side and, and really kind of get to know that side of me. And so um, Buddhism is a Asian, religion so I really want to get into it and so I actually have been and it's been very grounding for me and I feel like really understanding my emotions understanding that they're valid understanding that I'm okay in feeling this way knowing myself on different emotions understanding that it's okay to be mad sad in pain in anger in frustration all my emotions are valid and I think understanding that and also learning how to validate myself has been so pivotal in like understanding my character and my development and my identity so crucial to that and so i think that's been so good for me um i highly recommend buddhism because i feel like it can really apply to anyone's like anyone's life and i think you don't have to be asian to be practicing it you can just be someone who wants to incorporate mindfulness and yoga and just empathy and compassion into your life anyone could use that 
I could I could have used that. I am using that and I think I have a lot more to grow. But I do think that that's been really, really helpful for me to determine more of my values and and you know learning how to emotionally preserve myself and learning how to love myself and self-care and self-love so important um and so i think that actually that that actually also ties into um into the summer and so i think predominantly i've had a great summer i feel like i've really learned to come to terms with myself learn to grow on myself learn to understand myself uh, actually, this uh, 4th of July came into a very serious um, racial incident. However, I, I think that for me, I definitely applied a racialized lens, but uh, basically one of my high school classmates uh, ended up saying some derogatory things towards me, uh, which were directly in line with, you know, the kind of things, as I said before, fearing of being an Asian woman, being fetishized, objectified, stereotyped. Um, and so I think that kind of played out um, on a night that was actually happened to be the 4th of July weekend. And so I think that um, I was in a situation where I felt very hurt and very devalued and very mortified. And I feel like learning Buddhism and really learning on understanding my character and my worth and my value as an Asian woman really helped me to kind of bounce back and to understand like my coping mechanisms. And I definitely had a period of time, a couple days, where I was definitely taking time for myself, slowing down knowing what I wanted to do to make me feel happy to recover and I think that practicing that was so so crucial for my recovery that I was actually able to kind of recover and use my social media as a coping mechanism to kind of voice my opinions and amplify my POC voice in my community um to you know what the holiday means to me what fourth of July means to me what the American flag means to me and I think that's also kind of what prompted me to like from this video, I want other people in Norwich, other people in Davidson, other people in the world to understand my story and to understand where I'm coming from and, and why I'm saying these things. And I think that I want to, like people to learn my story and I want to be able to, you know, continue to emotionally preserve myself because I do think that constantly unearthing my trauma and like my story as an Asian American woman, I'm I don't know if you can tell, but I'm a very vulnerable person and I love sharing my story. However, repeatedly sharing my story to many people definitely gets a bit draining. So I definitely wanted to have an outlet where I could really say everything that's on the table and have this be spread among many other people and to share this video and to be able to have people understand where I'm coming from as an Asian woman, my own grounded lived experience. I'm not speaking for any other person in the Asian community, adopted community, Norwich community. This is my perspective. and. Yes, so I wanted to make that clear as well. So anyways, I am still on my anti-racist journey. Um, I would like to say that like, I have come a long way in, in determining my identity and kind of formulating where I am, where I stand in this world and kind of evaluating my intersectionality, as I said before, but I'm still on my anti-racist journey. I'm, I'm reading How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ephraim Kennedy. I'm reading this adoption thesis by a Davidson student. I'm constantly trying to have dialogues with other, you know, interracial relationships and um, like conversations with other racial groups. And I'm really trying to become an anti-racist and I really would suggest that you all do too because I think that there, everyone should be on a journey to be anti-racist, to learn and try to create a diverse and equitable space for all. Um, also know that it is also I've come to realize that you know as I've grown and been, been able to like discuss and dialogue and film this video that I obviously want to be in a job where I want to be educating like or I want to be helping marginalize people but I also have come to terms and, and know and know my emotional boundaries and my limits and understand that it's not my job as a person of color to educate other people it's just simply not my job and I need to know when to draw the boundaries and when to draw the line. Um, but all in all, I feel like I am proud to be an Asian woman. I'm proud to have come this far. I'm very proud of my growth and my journey. And it's not been easy. I've been going through a lot. And I think that I've really, I created all these healing diaries, as you can see in my YouTube channel, to really document my experience, my summer, practicing Buddhism, practicing coming to terms with myself, slowing down, meditating. I think that's been very good for me and I think that 
I'm still learning. I'm not only 19 and I don't know where life will take me next, but I'm very optimistic and I feel very lucky to be where I am. And I'm very proud to be an Asian woman, as I said before, despite all the slew of stereotypes. I do think that being an Asian woman and being adopted and having to go through all this has made me a stronger person, has shaped me into a character, shaped my character and, and strengthened my character and, and developed me into who I am today and, and made me more about, and strengthened my ability to face adversity, to persevere, to be able to adapt and have greater perspectives. And that's why I wanted to share this with you all. And I wanted to be able to share my story and be able to have you all understand or try to understand my own lived experience of being Asian, being in Vermont, being a woman, being at Davidson. I think that I want to remind all of my people of color for watching this, uh, especially women of color, that I am here. If you want to talk to me, want words of empowerment, want words of you know as much of wisdom that I can give you um I'm here for you all uh you are heard you are seen by me I understand what you go through every day I can try to understand from my own lived experience um I want this community to grow on my channel I want I'm not doing this for clout at all I want to just create more of a community of support so please reach out to me I really would love that I would really love to serve I want to continue to serve as an advocate, as an inspiration, as a mo person of empowerment, woman of empowerment for other people. So please reach out to me if you have any questions or want to talk further, anyone, uh, I'd be open. And um, as I say in my, um, as I say in my healing diaries, thank you all for coming to my video, for showing up, for being who you are and for being in the moment and for taking the time to listen to me. Thank you.